Look, I know you're here to listen to me talk about the NASCAR all-star race at Texas Motor Speedway, but before we do that, we gotta play the official Out of the Groove theme song for all these fans here. Yeah! It's Out of the Groove. I'm sorry, I actually kind of like the Sammy Hagar bit. I mean, it's the all-star race. Try something different. I can't fault you for that. But hey, how's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. Well, the son of a guns actually did it. NASCAR brought the all-star race to Fort Worth, Texas, Texas Motor Speedway, featuring one of the most convoluted formats any racing series has ever seen. We're gonna talk all about the format, the racing itself, those crazy moves that Hendrick teammates were throwing at each other late in this race, the pit stop competition that didn't get hardly any screen time, and much, much more. But first, this episode is sponsored by Blue Emu. That's right, the official pain relief cream of NASCAR. Blue Emu products, non-greasy, deep penetrating formula gets down deep into your muscles and joints to work its magic. Blue Emu, maximum pain relief. It works fast and you won't stay. They're huge supporters of NASCAR and huge supporters of Out of the Groove. Available at stores nationwide, Blue Emu, the official pain relief cream of NASCAR. I'm gonna attempt to make this video easier to follow than most of the racing action here tonight. The All-Star Race at Texas Motor Speedway. That's three different venues for the All-Star Race in three years. 2019, they were at Charlotte. Last year, they ran at Bristol. I was there and it kind of fell flat despite the uh, underglow and the slid back numbers and all that hype. This year, they brought it to Texas. This was sort of Texas Motor Speedway or Speedway Motorsports consolation prize for losing a points paying date to Circuit of the Americas. This way, Texas still gets two dates technically, All star and then we'll race there for points in the cup series in October. But ever since it was first announced, nobody, and I mean nobody, outside of maybe Eddie Gossage <laughs> was excited about the prospect of NASCAR bringing the all-star race to Texas Motor Speedway, one of the most lackluster tracks on the schedule and unfortunately has been really since they repaved it and reconfigured it in 2017. So knowing this, knowing that the racing is ugh, at Texas Motor Speedway, Eddie Gossage, Speedway Motorsports, they threw the kitchen sink at this event. Six different stages, three different types of inverts throughout the race, a pit stop competition thrown into the middle of the race for $100,000. They really tried today, tonight. They really did. I can respect Texas Motor Speedway, Speedway Motorsports, and NASCAR for trying. I applaud them for trying to make the all-star race unique. It's not a points paying race, and this year it was run at a track that has not historically put on great racing, so I'm glad that they tried just about everything they could to make this race special. All the way down to the pre-race show. I like the Wild Wild West Stockyards theme for driver intros. I thought the audio mix was not great. You couldn't hear the band they had playing live over the broadcast, at least. Hopefully you could hear it in the stands. That would be, that'd be unfortunate. And I joked at the beginning of this episode, but the Sammy Hagar random cameo to sing and to perform I Can't Drive 55 during the opening pace laps, yeah. <laughs> Twitter blew up when that happened. I don't know what the consensus is, but I'll just say I didn't hate it. You know, it's the all-star race. Make it something unique, make it special. I like that he was up in the grandstands with fans up all around him. I think that's cool for the fans in attendance. And I mean, be honest, would you rather have watched, you know, cars do pace laps for three minutes? You listen to Jeff Gordon and Clint Boyer desperately try to dial up someone who doesn't want to talk to them out on the racetrack? Or would you have rather seen a, a kind of a, an interesting, unique little mini pre-race performance. I, I mean, I think sure it went on a little too long. He probably should have just sang the first verse, maybe done the chorus once or twice and you know, packed it up and gone home. Instead, he played the whole song right up to the restart zone. That was a gutsy call, perhaps. Not a huge fan of that, but I didn't hate the pre-race concert. I didn't hate the pre-race show. I don't think it was flawlessly executed. I think running the, the opening segment of the All-Star Race in broad daylight just didn't look cool. Back when Monster Energy was the title sponsor of the All-Star Race for a couple of years there, you know, it took place at night. They had fog effects, lighting effects. Of course, they were able to have huge crowds gathered around the stage, which still during, you know, COVID times was not possible this weekend. But those looked really cool because it was dark. You could play with the lighting and stuff, trying to do this in broad daylight. I mean, sure, they brought the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders out. I'm sure many fans appreciated that but it did not have the same effect as recent all-star race pre-race shows. But I commend Texas Motor Speedway for trying to put their own spin on it. I liked the incorporation of a pit crew competition. I don't think it was executed very well at all. I think if you're gonna offer up a $100,000 bounty to the fastest pit crew, make it its own competition. Do it during that you know hour, hour and a half we had between the open and the all-star main event. Because the way they did it in the middle of you know that stage five, that 30 lap green flag run, like TV, 
mentioned it right before the stage began and then like didn't mention it again until like the very end of the stage when they were like, I, I think Chase Elliott was fast. I think Keselowski, they, they didn't know what was going on. And neither did the viewers at home because they didn't show pit stop times. They didn't have any sort of stopwatch on screen, no way to track it. It was really just, all right, we'll see you after the commercial break and we'll all find out together who won because we had no way of tracking it ourselves. So good idea, but really poor execution on that one. I'd love to see them bring back the pit crew challenge or competition, whatever it was called, you know, 10 years ago when they ran it, ran it in Charlotte like the night before or a couple days before the all-star race. That was really cool. Wish we'd bring that back. I mean, if we have $100,000 to just throw at a random team, I feel like we can find enough money to bring the pit crew challenge back you know, in the budget somewhere, but I don't know. Anyway, anyway, enough of the show, enough of the pre-race. This was Fox's final race of the season. Sayonara, we'll see what NBC can do. Let's talk about the racing. I'm just gonna gloss over the All-Star Open from earlier this afternoon. A couple notable storylines from that. The track temperature at the start was 145 degrees. That, I have not seen an official record kept, but that has to be one of the hottest track temperatures in NASCAR race history. And we saw it bite several drivers early on, guys getting loose, spinning out. Bubba Wallace spun out first, Eric Jones spun out later. I a couple others spun out later on in the race. The first stage of the All-Star Open was a bit sloppy, but we got a great battle at the end between Tyler Reddick and Ross Chastain. Ross Chastain won stage one. Tyler Reddick held on to win stage two. And Eric Almarola, finally, something went right for him this year. He won stage three. They all advanced to the All-Star Race tonight. And perhaps a little surprisingly, Matt DiBenedetto won the fan vote. I say surprising because, you know, two years ago, after what he did at Bristol in the night race, I wouldn't be shocked if Matt DiBenedetto won a fan vote. Every fan seemed to love Matt DiBenedetto two years ago, but since then he hasn't had a whole lot of success. Made the playoffs last year, yes, but is still winless for his career. I thought maybe the Matt DiBenedetto fans had sort of started to fizzle away perhaps, but I was clearly proven wrong. He wins the fan vote. I will say it's a bit surprising Bubba Wallace did not win. We don't know the exact tally. I don't know if Bubba was second or how close maybe he was to DiBenedetto, but I will say given how much media attention Bubba Wallace has gotten, given his following on social media, media, given all the press he's gotten, I'm surprised they weren't able to mount a more successful all-star vote campaign. It does make me wonder, I'm just thinking out loud here, if many of the, you know, casual new fans Bubba Wallace is reaching aren't sticking around in any major way, perhaps because they're tuning in and seeing Bubba Wallace run 20th more often than not, and that's given them a bad taste in their mouth. I talked all about that in a video, a couple videos earlier this year, and it might be coming true. Anyway, those are the four drivers who moved on to the All-Star Race main event. I'm not going to try to break down stage by stage. It was, it's too complicated to try and do that. There are inverts. I'll boil it down to this. After stage four, NASCAR added up, you know, all the points that drivers had earned over the first four stages. And that's how they lined up to begin stage five. And at that point, the fastest cars all night were at the front of the field. You know, I saw a lot of fans, including some well-respected motorsports journalists, saying that NASCAR was punishing the leaders with this all-star race format. And I don't see how that's the case at all. Because of those inverts, almost every driver spent some time near the front and spent some time near the back. And it was how you did. Did you maintain your position when you're at the front? Did you work your way through the field somewhat when you're in the back? It was the drivers who did those two things the best that got to restart at the front for the final stint of this race. So I don't see how that's punishing the leader when you have, you know, Kyle Larson, Chase Elliott, William Byron, Brad Kozowski, and Ryan Blaney, probably the five best cars all night long, restarting at the front of the field for the final 30 and then the final 10 lap segment. That's not punishing the leader. So I saw a lot of fans complaining about the format in that respect, and I think they were just factually incorrect there. That being said, the format was perhaps unnecessarily complicated. It was restart after restart after restart, inverts, putting faster cars behind slower cars, forcing passing, nobody could get away. The leader, I don't think the leader of this race ever was ahead by more than maybe seven tenths of a second. That's the kind of racing NASCAR was trying to contrive here. And I guess more or less they succeeded. We saw some great side-by-side -side battles in this race. Restarts, of course, there were many of them, but restarts were exciting. We had a couple spins, Ross Chastain spun after getting nudged a little bit by Ryan Newman. Early on, Christopher Bell spun, seemed to just get, get really loose. The track was still hot and slick and all the cars were really trimmed out for speed. But no big wrecks in the main event. It came down primarily to Hendrick Motorsports versus Hendrick Motorsports versus Hendrick Motorsports with a Penske car thrown in there for good measure to give the illusion of parity because right now the Hendrick cars just have something that none of the other teams have. Maybe 15 extra horsepower. That's been floated out there in recent weeks anyway. I haven't even mentioned it yet, but Kyle Larson wins. This is his second straight all-star race win. Remember he won in 2019, did not compete in the 2020 edition, and now he wins in 2021. He won at Charlotte, won in a Texas, nasty car, Hendrick car, and he did so thanks to 
an incredible move on the final restart. Larson was able to push both Chase Elliott and himself clear of the field, and then he went to the outside going into turn three. Highest speed corner on the track, way up high in the sticky stuff, which proved to be treacherous all weekend long. Just barely managed to hang on Elliott's right rear quarter panel, and they raced side by side for the lead. Ultimately, Kyle Larson came away with the top spot. He drove off to the victory. Brad Keselowski is able to get to second and certainly contended with him. Like I said, the leader never got away tonight, so Keselowski was always right there in case Larson made a mistake, but Larson has not made many mistakes this year, and he was mistake-free here tonight. He gets the win. He's a million dollars, or I'm sorry, $900,000 richer, I believe. Chase Elliott's team got the extra 100000 by winning the pit crew competition. I mean, what else can be said about Kyle Larson? He's the best race car driver in North America today, at the very least. I'd say arguably, and, and sure, maybe it still is, but boy, he is making a heck of a case this year, whether it's dirt, whether it's asphalt. High horsepower, low horsepower, ovals, road courses, it doesn't seem to matter. Kyle Larson is a beast right now. Let's take a look at the finishers, the top finishers of the All-Star Race tonight. Keselowski ends up second, a really good night for Penske when it's all said and done. Blaney had a lot of speed in this race as well. He was one of the few drivers I saw easily working his way through traffic when he, you know, got inverted to the rear of the field. He ends up with a top five finish. Chase Elliott sandwiched in there as well. He says he's not good at Texas, but he had a couple pretty good races this year across trucks and the cup race. Logano is in there as well, but then two more Hendrick cars. Alex Bowman, William Byron probably had one of the top two or three cars tonight, but he got a bad restart, got uh, put three wide by Ryan Blaney on the final restart, sucked into the middle and fell back to seventh. A good top 10 for Eric Amarola. I'm impressed that Kyle Bush ends up with a top 10. I know it doesn't really pay much in the all-star race, but he seemed to struggle with his car badly, almost from the get-go. So for him to get a top 10, that's just that's just KFB being really freaking talented. Kurt Busch ends up, uh, rounds out the top 10. Bell, McDowell, Trey, and, and go, so on and so forth. Let's be honest, only the, the win really matters in the all-star race. But there you have it. Those are your top finishers tonight. Let's put this thing on the groovy gauge. Poof, would you look at that? This race it's almost the exact opposite of last year's All-Star Race. This year's All-Star Race, Texas Motor Speedway, expectations were in the basement coming into this one, especially with the convoluted format. And I'd say all things considered, this event probably slightly exceeded most people's expectations. Compared to last year's All-Star Race, which is at Bristol under the lights, everyone was excited, and then the race sort of came and went, and we have kind of forgot about it two weeks later. All we remember from that race are the slid back numbers and the underglow. Chase Elliott fans remember their driver won, but that's about it. So I feel like this year versus last year's All-Star Race were kind of polar opposites in that regard. When it comes to the action on the track, whether it was entertaining or not, I think both races were comparable. Like last year's all-star race at Bristol was maybe boring for a Bristol race, but a boring Bristol race is still pretty darn good in my opinion. This race I think was more entertaining than your average Texas Motor Speedway race. Keep in mind your average Texas Motor Speedway race is usually kind of hard to watch, especially for the Cup Series. It, obviously all the restarts helped. This package thrives when cars are close together, able to hang on each other's quarter panels and force side side by side, three and four wide action. That's why we saw so many guys drafting up on each other. The field was usually pretty tightly packed together. It was close to what we saw in the 2018 All-Star Race at Charlotte, where it was just kind of a mini super speedway race in some regards. I'm not a big fan of this aero package. Yes, we saw in the open and we saw early in the All-Star Race, guys were somewhat on edge despite the big rear spoilers, the slick hot track made it easy to get sideways and, and spin out. And so at least that was, you know, you could tell the drivers were on edge early on in, the, in this event, but still not a huge fan of, you know, 500, 550 horsepower at Texas Motor Speedway. It, 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 I'm not a fan of baby super speedway races. If you want more super speedway races, just go back to Daytona and Talladega. They do it the best. If we're racing at Texas Motor Speedway, I want to see the cars on the edge of control, and we didn't get that consistently throughout tonight. Still saw some really gutsy, great moves like Blaney's three wide move on the final restart. Kyle Larson making that move on Chase Elliott a half a lap later. Ross Chastain made some daring moves tonight that were fun to watch. All in all, the point of this race was to be something different and it succeeded in that regard. Did every change work tonight? Like some people didn't like the Sammy Hagar impromptu concert. Some people did. The pit crew competition was a really good idea that was not really well executed. So no, not everything was great tonight, but all things considered, an all-star race at Texas Motor Speedway in the year 2021, I think tonight was about as good as you could hope for. So I'm gonna give this race a 65% on the groovy gauge, an above average event. I enjoyed it for the most part, despite its many confusing format anomalies throughout, but overall it was an entertaining race and 
The best teams and drivers found, found the front at the end and duped it out amongst themselves. That's all you can really hope for. So I'm gonna give it a 65%. Let me know what you guys thought of this race down in the comments below. I don't really have anything else to say. My head is hurting a little bit. I was doing a pretty good job the first like three or four stages of, of, of kind of keeping up with the format. Like the inverts were throwing me off a little bit, but I at least could kind of keep track. And Fox did a good job of showing the points those first few stages. So showing that William Byron had the best score and so on. But once the pit crew competition got thrown in there, then we had that wacky caution where Keslowski got his track position over Elliot and stuff like it became kind of a headache for a moment there so I, my head is hurting a little bit but I enjoyed this race for the most part let me know what you guys thought of it down below that's all I've got for this episode of Out of the Groove thank you all for watching be sure to subscribe if you're new to the channel we talk NASCAR day in day out I'm about to hit the road this week I'll be at Nashville Super Speedway this coming weekend for all three NASCAR events I'll be at Road America in a couple weeks and I'll have some other fun stops in between thank you as always to my amazing Patreon supporters couldn't do this show couldn't keep this channel going without your tremendous support I'll be back this week we'll talk NASCAR news we'll talk fallout from Texas Motor Speedway I saw the ratings for the inaugural SRX event are in and they are perhaps surprising so we'll have plenty to talk about this week have a fantastic rest of your weekend y'all I'll see you in the next video